So the testimony of God down inside of you has got to be the victory of God in you. It's an eternal weight of victory. Calling you beyond this natural realm and calling you to any eternal greatness with God. So your testimony has to be at that level and we make a decision that I want God's testimony to become my testimony. John's Gospel chapter 5 and look at this it says and this is verse 1. It's a miracle that takes place because Jesus is revealing the testimony of his father. And I like how we put it because the presence of God's testimony is always the presence of the miracle power of God. The Bible says that says there was a feast in the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And there was in Jerusalem by a place called the Sheep Gate of Pool, which is called in the Hebrew Bethsaida, which means house of mercy and a place of flowing water. That's really what that means. And the place had five porches in it. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. Now understand this. That means that God still was in the midst of the nation. Even, even before the covenant of Jesus Christ was established, God still revealed himself as their healer. The water was still there. The, the refreshing was still there. They just needed a permanency of God's kingdom to arrive. And here they would wait for that sovereign move of God, always dictating of himself, I am still in the house. And he said, for the angel would go down a certain time into the pool. Now this is not the story of an angel. This is what it says. So when John writes it, it's because this is what was taking place. It's amazing. The angel of God would occasionally come in, stir the water, people would get healed, but the nation was still back sudden and not recognizing that God is the healer, like he said all the way back when he gave it to Moses. I am the Lord that heals you. The angel went down a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water that whoever would step in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever, somebody say whatever, whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had had an infirmity of 38 years. Say there's no time limit with God. There is no time limit with God. All you got to do is get connected to what God is doing. It says, and man had an infirmity 38 years and when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, simply invaded his present grace or his present position and simply punched right through and said, do you want to be made whole? Just straight up like that. Jesus invaded the failures of 38 years of this man, 38 years of wanting to get into that pool, 38 years of hoping, and to the place where he was still there, and Jesus just walks up and says, do you want to be made whole? Can you imagine just out of eternity, stepping into your time, God just shows up and says, do you want to be healed? Do you want the breakthrough? Do you need the miracle? I mean, you can, we could say, and here's what he says. Notice, the, and the sick man answered him and said, sir, I don't have anything. I don't have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. But every time I'm trying to come, probably dragging himself, Another one steps down in before me. And Jesus just simply said, notice, Jesus didn't give any more explanation. He just said, rise up and walk. And notice, he says, rise up, take your bed and walk. And I guarantee you, the moment he released those words, there was a flow of explosive power that came from Jesus and hit that man right where he was at. The words exposed. There had to have been an anointing of miracle power flowing from Jesus. At the moment he released it, rise, take your bed and walk. The anointing of God hit him. And he instantly knew he was whole. The Bible says he stood up and he walked and he did his thing. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Somebody say hallelujah. Jesus invaded his, his position and let glory flow. Remember, he came to bring the kingdom, the kingdom that he's testifying of. Now I want you to look in verse 17. People didn't like that Jesus was doing this. It's always somebody who doesn't like your miracle. I don't know why. You want to get that phone? Okay. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, you take a message. Hopefully it's for me. If it's God, I'm, I'm here. And Jesus said, my father, here's the testimony. My father has been working until now. My father's never stopped working. Here's his testimony. My father has been working until now. And because he's working, what? I'm working. Heaven is working. And because heaven's working, I'm working. Talk about a testimony. 
My father is working, so I'm working. He goes on and he says in verse 19, Most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but everything he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the father, the son is doing in like manner. It's not a watered down. It's the Father. Understand, your heavenly Father is always moving in the declaration of the testimony of the victory of the kingdom. And here you've got Jesus walking with that identity and with that testimony, and he is doing everything he sees his Father do. So you realize the love of the Father is being demonstrated through Christ. That is the testimony. My Father's doing it, I'm doing it. My Father's doing it, I'm doing it. I'm watching my Father by the Holy Ghost, and every Everything he's doing, I'm doing the exact same thing. I can't hold back. I can't stop. I can't sit down because my father is always moving. Amen. God is always moving. You want to be healed now? Why? Because the father is moving now. Your healing is now. Why? Because my father is moving. That's his testimony. I like that. He said, for the father loves the son and shows him, notice this, everything. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. That's why later on in John's gospel, he's going to say in the spirit of God, he's going to take everything that belongs to Jesus and he's going to reveal it to you so you get a chance to see everything that the Father is doing. And you become participants and the testimony of God says, my gosh, everything the Father's doing, the Son is now doing and it's flowing to us so God can continue doing everything that the Father is doing. How? Through your life. You become part of the testimony. He says... For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything that he himself does, and he will show him even greater things. How could he do that? Very simply, when Jesus is ascended and seated at the right hand of power, there was limitlessness now in the revelation of the kingdom of God. Jesus is operating singularly here. But when he gets under the throne of his Father, there'll be unlimited authority being able to flow from heaven by the Spirit of God into millions upon millions upon millions of lives. There are greater things always coming. God, is, God doesn't slow down. God doesn't back down. He says, so you're going to see greater works than these because I go to my Father. Now go to Revelation. This is one chapter that I, re, that I use this a lot. Because I want people to get this into the spirit. Revelation chapter 12. Jesus testified of the Father. The Father's doing, I'm doing. And there's even greater things coming. Somebody say greater things. That means God is not a God of lack or diminish. He's a God of abundance and increase. Where sin abounds, what does the Bible say in Romans? Grace abounds much more. No matter how dark it gets, God pushes back much more. Not at an equal pace, but at a much greater pace. Church, that's why we have the right, no matter how dark it seems to get, to expect that the light of God is going to shine much greater than we've ever seen before. It is pushback time by the Holy Ghost. Pushback time in the Spirit of God. There's a testimony of increase, and we make a decision. Either we cower back or we believe the Word. My God, sin's abiding, sin's abiding so greater grace must be coming. Greater than all the revivals and awakenings you've seen in the past. We have not seen yet what God can do in this generation. Every generation has been building faith moving, healing moving, the outpouring of the joy and the things of God. Now let's bring it all together as one big great outpouring and watch God liberate people from the sole of their feet to the crown of their head and do exploits and demonstrate his kingdom into this nation. So even the heathens will have to take note. There's a God in the midst of that body of believers. There's a God in the midst of the church. Where is the genuine body of Christ so God can demonstrate himself? And you are part of that genuine body of Christ. Bless the Lord. Now notice. Verse 10, chapter 12 of the book of Revelation. Chapter 12, and I heard a loud voice shout. Talk about a testimony out of heaven. Nothing quiet. And you imagine, it is a prophetic declaration. Now salvation has come. Now the strength of God has come. Now the kingdom of God has come. Now the power of his Christ has come. Now it's come. 
Now salvation, the full redemption of God's kingdom. Now the, now the very strength of God, which is the outpouring power of the Holy Ghost to, in order to liberate you. Now is the kingdom, the government of God, and now is the strength or the authority to use it. That's exactly what he said here. The salvation of God has now come. And the power of God to bring it into existence has come. And the kingdom of God to take its place. And the authority of God to begin to use it. Somebody say, use it. Use it. Use it. You know the old saying, use it or lose it. That's the statement here. And it says, but the accuser of our brethren has been cast down. Accused them day and night. And they overcame him. Somebody say, overcame. By the blood that washes them and by the testimony. By the word of their testimony. That's why we got to ask ourselves, what is our testimony? What is our testimony? I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 54. What is our testimony? Jesus healed this man because he's testifying to the Father. The Father's always doing. And then we see why. Because, because salvation has come. Power has come. The kingdom has come. Strength of God has come. The authority has come. All, been, all of these have been made present. Can you imagine? All of this has been presented to us. To win. To bring souls to the kingdom. To hold hell back until God gets his harvest. Do you understand? Yeah, the world's going to go to the Antichrist. But not yet. Do you understand? Not yet. They can be, they can saber rattle, they can threaten, they can bring all the fear that they want. We make two decisions. Either we cave under it or we shout, not yet. Amen. You don't do something good, then evil is going to take its place. Where do I got you? Isaiah 54. That's why the church cannot be passive in this season. Church don't want to touch the issues, you're in the wrong church. Because the body of Christ must be aggressive in revealing the kingdom of God. And it must be relevant. He used to say we want you to be relevant, which meant compromise. No, relevant is relevant to the word and confronting a backslidden nation. That's relevant. I want you to look at verse 14, chapter 54 of Isaiah. This is testimony. This is what the heavens shouted, it's testimony. Jesus was demonstrating the testimony of his father. And now we see again here that doesn't matter which form because when you got the testimony of God's kingdom coming, now we need God to back it up with his word to cover and protect us. So we have the testimony of the word. It says in verse 14, in righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression for you shall not fear. Somebody say, I will not fear. Say, I will not fear. I will not fear. Fear, you are under my feet. You are under my feet. Come on, put your feet on it. Fear, you're under my feet. I'll not be moved by what I see. Hallelujah, I'm going to be established. Fear is all, fear is a false evidence that appears real. That's all it is. You are walking by the faith of God. It's pushback time. You shall not fear from terror, for it shall not come near you. Indeed, they shall say, assemble, even though they shall surely assemble, but not because of me. Have you noticed it is what is happening? There was a unified effort to silence your faith happening right now. There was a unified, don't get fearful, get an attitude, tell it. Bada bing, bada bop ya. Okay, I know three words in Italian, okay? So everything else has got to be Americanized. It says here, the word tells us something which gives us the authority to push back until the day. See, hell has to be so aggravated. That liberal spirit has to be so hateful. And the only reason it can be that way is because we're holding it back from being effective. They can scream, they can holler, they can threaten, they can lie, they can bring deception, but they cannot overthrow God's will. They are nothing. They are dust in the wind. They are burned embers turning into ashes. They have nothing. As long as we stay our course, stay our ground, and keep pushing and declaring, heaven will act on our behalf. I know I shouldn't shout so much. 
Indeed, they shall surely assemble, but not because of me. Whoever assembles against you shall fall. Why? Because he says, just in the vernacular here, no matter what weapon's ever fashioned, I'm the authority over every weapon that's ever fashioned. They can fashion all they want, but I carry sovereign authority over every weapon. Behold, I created the blacksmith who blows the, who blows the coals in the fire or brings forth an instrument for work. I created it. I, you know what? I'm authority over every weapon. Even a, even a spoiler or someone to be useful for my kingdom, whatever. But he says there, verse 17, therefore, it doesn't matter what comes against you because I didn't send it and I'm Lord over all their weaponry. I can turn their weapons into plastic in their hands if I choose to, says the Lord. They will melt right away. No weapon formed against you will succeed if you stand your ground. Do you understand? If you turn and run, change your testimony, drop your conviction, Quit pressing forward, then the enemy is already won and he never even used the weapon. He just terrified you by holding it in his hand. That makes sense? Mm -mm -mm -mm. So no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Hallelujah. Every tongue which tries to rise against you in judgment, you will condemn. Bless the Lord. It's not out of hate, it's out of boldness. You don't, you don't play patty cake with devils and demons in the spirit of hell and darkness. You speak the truth. You call it out. You reveal it by the Holy Ghost for what it is. You let the gifts of the Spirit and the authority of God begin to declare what's really happening behind the scenes. And when you speak it forth, it'll cut straight to the heart of what is evil. And they'll have to cower away because they do not carry the authority. They do not carry the way. Because the principalities and their powers have both been defeated by the Lordship of Jesus Christ for the sake of building his church. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail till I get what I've come for. I will have my bride, my my church, it's going to happen, doesn't matter what the devil does. That's why we must be diligent. Because the word tells us, chapter 55, everyone who thirsts, come to me. Say, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. You who have nothing, come by and eat of what is good. He's telling them it's not the natural. It's what I possess that is your satisfaction. Nothing in the natural can satisfy you because you are satisfied by the Spirit of God. And when you are, the, the world and the Spirit of the world has nothing to tempt you with. There's no gold thing up there and, and nothing of a favor here they can tempt you with because you're not satisfied by anything the world has to offer. You are thirsty for something that's beyond natural realms. You're thirsty for God. My testimony is I want God. My, my thirst is after God. It's not what I need in this life. God's got me covered. It's what I want from the next life because that is going to satisfy me for eternity. One day in the course with God. One day in his course is like a thousand years in today. One day. One day of his glory. So much better. Verse 8. Because he told them, I'll give you the sure mercies of David. Now, you know what the testimony of the... I'm just going to... Let me back up there for a second. It says, because... Look at verse three and a half. If there is such a thing as a half in your Bible, go there. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. I was thinking about that. Sure mercies of David. What was David besides a great king? David was a warrior. David fought enemies on every single front. David was the one that had to expand the kingdom. Saul was the first king and he failed miserably. And all the enemies once again invaded the nation. So David became the king who had to push back at every single corner. And God gave him the mercy to win every single battle. The sure mercies of David. David testified in psalm after psalm. 
how God brought the deliverance, how God brought the breakthrough. Things that are not even written here, David testified about wars and battles that you just don't have in Chronicles or Kings, but you have definitely in the Psalms because David said, and again and again and again and again and again, God anointed me and his mercy was with me. And there was a thorn that was pushed back because he called me to advance and take charge of his kingdom. So the mercies of God or the mercies that he gave to David belong to you for your battle. What a testimony. Because you're a fighter. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. Says the Lord, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and does not return, notice the first testimony, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. The second testimony is my word shall never return void. My word, say my word. My word will not return void. Now, I said this the other day. In order for the word to not return void, you have to release it. Somebody say release it. Okay. Let me tell you what that means, believers. You have to speak forth what God's word says. You have to go to war into the heavenly realms. You have to declare what God says. You have to allow the spirit of God to go forth. Don't just think it in your head. Start to release it. Start to declare it. Start to speak the word. By his stripes you are healed. He is your deliverer. He is your provision. He is your covering. He is the one that overshadows you. He is the one that is ever present. He is your righteousness. He is the one that is the banner. He is the one that is your prayer. He is everything to you and you speak Speak it forth, and you control the environment around you by the testimony of God that's moving through you. Does that make sense to somebody? We get ourselves into a world like this, and God wants us to take dominion over the borders. The testimony of God's got to become the testimony of you, so you're surrounding. When you walk in, the testimony of God needs to be with you. The angels of God need to be encamped about you because you are a warrior in the Holy Ghost. You got the testimony of God in you and you are speaking. So it doesn't matter what this spirit is or what that attitude is or what that, or, or what that devil is about. It doesn't matter. When you walk in the world, all that evil is there, but you're walking with the testimony of God. Somebody say hallelujah. When you walk into Jewel and Walmart and everywhere else, you got the testimony of God. Hallelujah. Because there's some really broken, miserable people there. But you got yourself covered. You've got the joy of God. You got the testimony. So he says, My word will not return void, for whatever I send it to do, it shall accomplish in the thing in which I've sent it. Now I'll go back in Isaiah to Isaiah chapter 12. In that day you will say, say this is verse 1. In that day you will say. I like how Isaiah puts that. In that day, you will say. That's the day when he says, because of what I'm going to bring you, you're going to say what I brought you. And in that day, you will say, oh, Lord, I will praise you. And he says, though it would seem like you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you have now comforted me. Because God Almighty is my redemption, and I will trust and not be afraid. For the ultimate Jehovah, the ever-present God, is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. I will say, my ever-present King is my salvation. My ever-present King. Listen, listen, listen. My ever-present King is my salvation. My ever present. That's your testimony. My king is with me. My king is with me. There may have been anger for a season, but at Calvary, I've been won back. I got peace with God, and my king is my ever present salvation. And he said, you will say that. Can you imagine if, if the church actually began to testify to the things were supposed to be being taught inside the building? People actually knew that there were Christians in this world. Because you are constantly testifying to the victory of God. Your faith is what everybody else needs. Look at verse 3. And I like this. I actually like it all. I get excited about the word. Oh, jeez. So therefore, therefore, I'm going to say joy. Say great joy. Don't just say joy. Say great joy. I talk to my dog, I say, you're a dork. 
But this is joy. This is joy. Like a dog. But this is joy. And how they're going to translate that over overseas. You know? We laugh about those things once in a while. I say some things and overseas, and, and, and you're watching me right now. I mean, that's what they're going to be doing, getting the program. And, and, they, and they translate the program into their language. And when I say weird things, we sometimes have to stop and say, well, you know what? I'm preaching to you, too. So, sorry, guys. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, there I was. I got lost there for a second. Verse, verse, verse 3, therefore with joy. You will draw water from the wells of salvation. This will be your testimony with great joy. I draw from God of the wells of the upspring, which is what it means. It's not a still well. It's an upspringing well with joy because of God's deliverance. I will draw the waters of heaven. Do you imagine the Spirit of God flowing through the body of Christ? With joy, we're drawing water from the wells of redemption. With joy, we're drawing the infilling power, the delivering healing grace, the testimony of God. With joy, we are overflowing with kingdom authority. With joy, we are drinking till you are more than satisfied. I need to bring it down. It's like kind of like, okay. Go to Mark 11, and I'll just close it for this. I just get so going on things, and we're supposed to be preaching three-point sermons. Well, I don't, if you all haven't noticed. And I kind of like it that way. I hope you do, too. We can have a little fun then. I can shout, stand on chairs. I don't see it as any other way, pastors. You might as well fall in love with the call of God and you might as well be extremely radical and you may better, you recognize it's not a job. It's your purpose on this earth and enjoy it with everything you've got. Stir your people. Get them to the place where they become God hungry and they run out that door full of the Holy Ghost and fire and they bring that joy to somebody else who desperately needed it because you stood on a chair and they got excited about what you did and they realized there is no limit in God and they can be as excited as they they want to be with a smile on their face there is a river that just the stream will set you on fire the things of God I want people so God I want you so thirsty I want you so thirsty for God I want you so thirsty for his authority so thirsty for his anointing you know the day of Pentecost they were Bible said that they're like a bunch of drunken people 120 drunks in the Holy Ghost they're making fun of them because they're laughing, they're rolling, they're praying in tongues, prophesying. They are just, they're having a God time. Everybody's going, these are drunk. No, they're not. This is that which was spoken. God doesn't dip. He pours. How do you get anointed to stand up against devils, demons, darkness, and threats against your life? even being put to death without a fire of anointing and joy and glory satisfying your very being. In the natural world, people get so drunk and get so stupid that they couldn't even feel if you stuck them with a pen. Can you imagine being so drunk in the Holy Ghost that somebody tried to come after your life and it doesn't bother you one bit because God's glory has so swept through your being. You will keep running your race all the way to the day and never compromise your testimony. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Okay, anyways, have the faith of God. And what that is, look, look, look what we just said, the testimony of God, his salvation. The power of God to break every yoke, the kingdom of God, the authority to exercise, the rivers of water. Everything that God has to hold you and strengthen is the confession you have to fight every battle you need to fight. He says, have the faith of God. I tell you, surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, which means it doesn't matter how big your problem is. Doesn't matter how big the devil is in your nation. Doesn't matter how big the principality is trying to overthrow your city or your community. There is a bigger God and a confession in you that can break that thing and shatter its hold and drop that thing to its knees to have to confess that Jesus is Lord. There is a stronger anointing in the body of Christ. We don't have to step back. 
but we unify ourselves in one accord and we speak the whole truth and nothing but the truth and we stand our ground. The Bible said, you go ahead and you speak to this mountain and you command it out of your way and it shall be done. If you believe in your heart, because you know it's in God's will and you know it's under God's anointing and you know by the word of faith that heaven wants you to declare it and you know it's buried and filled with his truth, we have the right to speak it until we see it come to pass. The government, the kingdom, the authority, and the anointing belongs to you. Stand to your feet in the house.